Welcome to Psychological Explorations with Dr. Michael Axelman and Daniela. Today we'll be exploring a chapter from Thomas Ogden's first book, Projective Identification and Psychotherapeutic Technique. Thomas Ogden, one of the luminaries of San Francisco psychoanalysis. He went to Amherst and received an MD from Yale University and did his training out at San Francisco Psychoanalytic Institute and remained on the faculty for uh, 30, 40 years after that. 12 public, 12 books multiple, multiple publications, novels, Thomas Ogden, and his really clear articulation of a complex intrapsychic, interpersonal topic, the concept of projective identification. Projective identification as thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Projective identification is a concept that addresses the way in which feeling states corresponding to unconscious fantasies of one person, the projector, are engendered in and processed by another, the recipient. That is, the way in which one person makes use of another person to experience and contain an aspect of himself. Most fundamentally, however, it is a statement about the dynamic interplay of the two, the intrapsychic and the interpersonal, the usefulness of many existing psychoanalytic propositions is limited because they address the intrapsychic sphere exclusively and fail to afford a bridge between that sphere and the interpersonal interactions that provide the principal data of the therapy. Projective identification as fantasy and object relationship. We see a process involving the following sequence of events. First, there is the unconscious fantasy of projecting a part of oneself into another person and of that part taking over the person from within. Then there is pressure exerted through the interpersonal interaction such that the recipient of the projection experience pressure to think, feel, and behave in a manner congruent with this projection. Finally, after being psychologically processed by the recipient, the projected feelings are re-internalized by the projector. So let's take a closer look at these three phases. Phase one, the wish to evacuate unwanted aspects. Wishes to rid oneself of a part of the self, including internal objects, either because that part threatens to destroy the self from within, or because one feels that the part is in danger of attack by other aspects of the self and must be safeguarded by being held inside a protective person. The fantasy of putting a part of oneself into another person and controlling that person from within reflects a central aspect of projective identification. So we move to phase two in which the recipient is pressured to engage in an identification with a specific disowned aspect of the projector. <clears throat> 
The projector exerts pressure on the recipient to experience himself and behave in a way congruent with the unconscious projective fantasy. Real pressure exerted by means of a multitude of interactions between the projector and the recipient. Projective identification does not exist where there is no interaction between projector and recipient. The therapist is made to feel the force of the fear of becoming non-existent for the patient if he ceases to behave in compliance with the patient's projective identification. The pressure can be so strong and so profound during this phase that it's very hard to keep oneself from moving into action. I now read briefly the case of the 12 year old female patient so that we can get a clear idea about this second phase. A 12 year old inpatient who as an infant had been violently intruded upon psychologically and physically highlights this aspect of projective identification. The patient said and did almost nothing on the ward that made her presence powerfully felt by perpetually she jostling and bumping into people, especially her therapist. This was generally experienced as infuriating by the other patients and by the staff. In the therapy hours, often a play therapy, her therapist said that he felt as if there was no space in the room for him. Everywhere he stood seemed to be her spot. This form of interaction represents a form of object relationship where the patient puts pressure on the therapist to experience himself as inescapably intruded upon. This interpersonal interaction constitutes the induction phase of this patient's projective identification. And we move to phase three. After being psychologically processed by the recipient, the projected feelings are re-internalized by the projector in a new way. The possibility that the projected feelings, more accurately the congruent set of feelings elicited in the recipient, will be handled differently from the manner in which the projector has been able to handle them. A new set of feelings is generated. This can be viewed as a processed version of the original projected feelings. This digested projection is available through the recipient's interactions with the projector for internalization by the projector. Whatever the form of the reinternalization process, it offers the projector the potential for attaining new ways of handling feelings that he formerly wished to disavow. I go now to another case example The following is an example of projective identification involving a recipient more integrated and mature than the projector. Mr. K had been a patient in analysis for about a year, and the treatment seemed to both patient and analyst to have bogged down. The patient repetitively questioned whether he was getting anything out of it and stated maybe it's a waste of time. It seems pointless 
and so forth. He had always paid his bills grudgingly, but had begun to pay them progressively later and later to the point where the analysts began to wonder if the patient would discontinue treatment, leaving one or two months bill of bills unpaid. Also, as the sessions dragged on, the analysts thought about colleagues who held 50-minute sessions instead of 55-minute ones and charged the same fee as himself. Just before the beginning of one session, the analyst considered shortening the hour by making the patient wait a couple minutes before letting him into the office. All of this occurred without attention being focused on it, either by the patient or the analyst. Gradually, the analyst found himself having difficulty ending the sessions on time because of an intense guilt feeling that he was not giving the patient his money's worth. When this difficulty with time had occurred repeatedly over several months, the analyst gradually began to understand his trouble in maintaining the ground rules of the analysis. He had been feeling greedy for expecting to be paid for his worthless work and was defending himself against such feelings by being overly generous with his time. With this understanding of the feelings that were being engendered in him by the patient, the analyst was able to take a fresh look at the patient's material. Mr. K's father had deserted him and his mother when the patient was 15 months old. Without ever explicitly saying so, his mother had blamed the patient for this. The unspoken shared feeling was that the patient's greediness for the mother's time, energy, and affection had resulted in the father's desertion. The patient developed an intense need to disown and deny feelings of greed. He could not tell the analyst that he wished to meet more frequently because he experienced this wish as greediness that would result in abandonment by the transference father and attack by the transference mother that he saw in the analyst. Instead, the patient insisted that the analysis and the analyst were totally undesirable and worthless. The interaction had subtly engendered in the analyst an intense feeling of greed, which was felt to be so unacceptable to the analyst that at first he too tried to deny and disown it. We see here the way in which the analyst was able to stay in there with this projection until he was able to reach an understanding about it in himself that could open up this new pathway for his patient to understand. And we see that the roots are in early developmental setting. Projective identification is a psychological process that is at once a type of defense, a mode of communication, a primitive form of object relations, and a pathway for psychological change. And this final point is just a key contribution from Ogden that Projective identification opens up this pathway for psychological change, new experience. Projective identification is an adjunct to the infant's efforts at keeping what is felt to be good and safe at a safe distance from what is felt to be bad and dangerous. Through the mother's interactions with the child, the processed projection which involves the sense of the mother's mastery of her feelings of frustration and destructive and retaliatory wishes would be available to the child for re-internalization. But the mother failed right to process this feeling and the projection was experienced and lived out as real. Historically, the term projective identification was introduced by Melanie Klein, 
in her paper, Notes on Some Schizoid Mechanisms, 1946. Balint cautions us against having to interpret or in other ways having to act on the feelings the patient elicits. Instead, the therapist must accept, feel with, tolerate, and bear with the patient and the feelings with which he is struggling and asking the therapist to recognize. So in terms of clinical technique, what does the therapist do when he is aware that he is the recipient of the patient's projective identification? Firstly, contain. When the patient is feeling hopelessly unlovable and untreatable, the therapist must be able to bear the feelings that the therapist and the therapy are worthless for this hopeless patient. And yet at the same time, not act on the feelings by terminating the therapy. The truth that the patient is presenting must be treated as transitional phenomena and if you're interested in exploring this topic in more depth, uh, we have a whole podcast devoted to Winnicott's paper on transitional objects, transitional phenomena. The truth that the patient is presenting must be treated as transitional phenomena, wherein the question of whether the patient's truth is reality or fantasy is never an issue. The therapist attempts to live with the feeling that he is involved in a hopeless therapy with a hopeless patient and is himself a hopeless therapist. And along with containing, interpreting the therapist's ability not only to understand but also to verbalize his understanding clearly and precisely is basic to therapeutic effectiveness. The issue of timing, when interpretation should remain silent. However, the therapist's understanding may at times contain the correct interpretation for the therapist, but may not be at all well-timed for the patient. In this case, the interpretation should remain a silent one. That is formulated in words in the therapist's mind, but not verbalized to the patient. Continued self-analysis in this way is invaluable in a therapist's attempt to struggle with, contain, and grow from the feelings patients are eliciting in them. when to be silent. What an important point. The failure to contain projective identification. We have the failure to process of projective identification as reflected in the therapist's response in one of two ways, either by his mounting a rigid defense against awareness of the feelings engendered or allowing the feeling or defense against it to be translated into action. Leading to violations of frames such as extending relationships into social contexts, giving gifts to the patient or encouraging the patient to give gifts to the therapist or breaching the code of confidentiality. In closing, Ogden shares light on two other terms, projection and externalization. And projection, it differs from projective identification in that is the aspect of the self that is in fantasy is expelled and disavowed and attributed to the recipient. In this case, the recipient 
is experienced as foreign, strange, or perhaps even frightening. So we don't have the projector going through the identification process. In externalization, which is a type of projective identification, rather than simply altering the psychological representation of an external object, one attempts to and often succeeds in affecting specific alterations in the feeling state and behavior of another person. And we have discussed this earlier. And in this way, externalization is just an aspect of projective identification. Thank you for joining us today in Psychological Explorations. Please come back and join us for future podcasts. Thank you.